Hello dear viewers, this is George from Ireland and I'm carrying on my series about the Northern Irish Troubles. So I left off talking about the Anglo-Irish Agreement of 1985. Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer because it's not between England and uh, Ireland, it's obviously between the UK and Republic of Ireland, but there we are. Um, so the Irish government kept the SDLP completely briefed on the situation. An SDLP organiser such as Mark Durkin at that time he was uh, invited to stay in Irish embassies around the world. Um, the Unionist uh, parties were not uh, informed at all. They're in the dark. So um, uh, let me see. Garrett Fitzgerald was Taoiseach, and London found him easier to deal with than his predecessor, Charles Hockey. Um, there was an attempt to improve relations. It was quite strained around 1981. It's one of the reasons why perhaps the UK ought to have made some concessions to the hunger strikers just because it made the situation of the Irish government and the SDLP very awkward indeed. Um, anyway, uh, so and Thatcher thought she could have a role for the Irish government in Northern Ireland to act as an advocate for the nationalist community, although Dublin was doing that anyway. And Irish civil servants were brought up to Maryfield outside Belfast to monitor the situation, make suggestions... Um, or uh, unionists could have devolution, but only if they went into coalition with the SDLP. So the Irish government at the time was um, a coalition, as it usually is, composed of Fine Gael and the Labour Party, led by Dick Spring. So they were more moderate on Northern Ireland, and they were open to uh, compromise. So in return, um, Thatcher was hoping for fulsome security cooperation from the Irish Republic, Fine Gael um, was a uh, more obdurate on the northern issue. Um, anyway, uh, it was fiendishly difficult to get an agreement, and um, when it was put to Parliament, this was carried by an enormous majority. Only about thirty MPs voted against. They were real hardline unionists who formed the Friends of the Union. Um, so uh, one of Thatcher's um, cabinet resigned over the issue. Ian Gow. Um, and he formed his friends of uh, yeah friends of the union. As I said, they used to have Ulster Fry breakfast. That's a cooked breakfast. Um, when they would gather to fulminate about this, um, Viscount Cranbourne did as well. His uh, great grandfather, the Marcus of Salisbury, had been a firm loyalist in the eighteen eighties. One who really, I suppose, laid the groundwork for partition eventually. So. Um, Anyway, the idea of assemblies, uh, local assemblies, was nothing new. In the late 70s, it had been one. It was a talking shop, came to nothing. In the early 80s, another one elected, and again, hadn't got off the ground. So devolution was supposed to be a sweetener to make this more alluring to unionists. And almost all unionists wanted devolution, but they were only to be, to be allowed it on condition that they shared office with the SCLP. So the whole agreement was signed at Hillsborough Castle, just outside Belfast. That is the Queen's official residence in Northern Ireland. She almost never goes there. Um, it was signed at Belfast because it thought the Republic of Ireland would be unsafe for Thatcher. It was very difficult for the guards to guarantee her security. And as Thatcher said at the time that Dr Fitzgerald will always remain a nationalist, I will stay a unionist. Um, Thatcher um, had once said how Northern Ireland was as British as her Finchley constituency, which doesn't make sense because, of course, a considerable minority of people in Northern Ireland did not consider themselves British and indeed wished to join an adjacent country. Though there are foreign citizens in Finchley, um, they're not, they don't dispute that Finchley is part of the United Kingdom, and uh, they, they wouldn't be as high as 35% of the population, I don't think, certainly in those days. So Unionists were incensed by this Anglo-Irish agreement because it came as a shocker to them, um, uh, whereas the SDLP had been kept brief, briefed. So um, it was a bit of a turnaround. The SDLP were in the know and they weren't. So uh, a rude awakening for Unionists. They'd had it all their own way for quite a long time and uh, they couldn't take it. So huge rallies were organised. And of course, um, uh, Paisley was there tub, th tub thumping, saying uh, these terrorists, they come from the Republic of Ireland, they commit their crimes here, and they go back, their blood smeared, and that government is to have some say in the affairs of Ulster. We say never, never, never. Um, he ranted out in front of, in front of Belfast City Hall. And unionists of various shades, they formed the majority of Belfast City Council, and on Belfast City Hall they had um, a huge banner for years, Ulster says no, as in, to uh, a united Ireland. Um, so the... Uh, the uh, UUP and DUP were, of course, against, as were the loyalist terrorists. The Alliance Party was in favour. Um, anyway, uh, so no referendum was held on this in Northern Ireland, but, you know, it was a UK-level matter because 
This was the United Kingdom's relationship with an adjacent country, although it particularly concerned one region of the UK. So um, Thatcher was not going to hold a referendum on it. She wasn't legally obliged to. But uh, I think she knew which way the result would go. She had been warned there would be op unionist opposition, but it turned out to be more ferocious than um, she had been led to anticipate. Um, anyway, the idea of independence for Northern Ireland came back in uh, loyalist circles. Uh, so Paisley was saying, we'll not be handed over like a turkey bound at Christmas to the Irish Republic. Now, what Paisley had said about the IRA um, seeking safe havens, havens in the Republic of Ireland is true. Uh, the guard of Shona Corner tried to catch them, occasionally did catch them, sent them to Port Leisure Prison, and occasionally Mount Joy. But uh, Paisley was obviously being selective because um, they were loyalist terrorists too, and they sometimes attacked the Irish Republic. In the early 70s, when people had tried to build better relations between the two parts of Ireland, uh, hands across the border was the expression. Uh, Paisley had said at a rally, if those people in the South don't behave themselves, there'll be shots across the border. So it was incendiary rhetoric from him uh, yet again. So the, the DUP, they didn't want to go to coalition with the SDLP. Um, they preferred full integration in the UK. And they were bitterly let down because they believed in Thatcher, the Conservative Unionist Party, as she didn't mind calling her party. So Paisley said that politics, well, democracy was all about numbers. The majority wanted to be in the UK, and that was that. Labour and the Tories weren't forced to share office. Well, why should the SDLP be allowed to share office with the UUP or indeed the DUP? So there were big protests. Um, the Northern Ireland Secretary at the time was Tom King. And um, irate loyalist protesters found, followed him around to monster him wherever he went. Um, so the SDLP had to protect him. They, they weren't trying to kill him, though. Uh, but um, the RUC had to protect him. Did I say the wrong thing? There was a mole in the Northern Ireland office who was tipping off these loyalist protesters where he was going to be. Um, George Seawright was a DUP councillor. He was actually born in Scotland to uh, Northern Irish parents. He was an Orangeman. He'd been working in the shipyards since he was a teenager. But he was in Northern Ireland at the time, and um, he jumped on Tom King's uh, car and uh, was a very high-profile protester. So as Thatcher wouldn't put it to a vote in Northern Ireland, the Ulster Unionists and the DUP said, we'll hold a referendum of our own of sorts. So they all resigned their seats. Strictly speaking, since the 17th century, people have been unable to resign from the House of Commons. So they applied for an office of profit under the Crown, being steward of the Chiltern Hundreds. And all, all 11 of them, I think, went through that in one day. It's a bizarre legal rigmarole. But anyway, so there were constituencies, we're all going to have you holding... Um, by-elections about the same time in early 1986 and these unionists put up a dummy candidate against themselves in the name of Peter Barry, the Irish Foreign Minister, he of the Cork Tea family. Um, and this was going to be their um, pseudo-referendum. The DUP and UUP agreed they would not fight a sitting MP. The DUP stock had risen because of Paisley's um, ferocious uh, rhetoric on the Anglo-Irish agreement. So this is probably more advantageous to the UUP than the other way around. But anyway, the unionists had an all right result. They were all returned apart from um, in South Down, the SDLP unseated um, uh, Enoch Pohl. Eddie McGrady became the MP. I should have mentioned Enoch Pohl was um, the Conservative MP for um, Wolverhampton Southwest. Uh, he gave this uh, notorious um, inflammatory oration, the Rivers of Blood's Breach, way back in March 1968. But he left the Conservative Party over the European Economic Community. In 1974, in fact, he'd urged Tories to vote Labour. And in a knife-edge election, such an influential po politician may have actually handed the election to Labour. But anyway, he'd been recruited to be an Ulster Unionist MP in October 1974. And Ulster Unionists were very satisfied with this because he was someone with a UK-wide profile and he was seen as a right-wing guru. That was that. The trouble was, he was a hate figure for much of Labour, despite having won them the 1974 election. Labour's Tory, as a, the, um, a chapter in his biography, like the Roman by Simon Heffer says. Um, Labour reviewed him as vile, as viciously racist, and so on. The, the Liberals saw he was racialist as well. Um, so, so that was that. So Labour was increasingly impatient with Unionists. And the Labour Manifesto of 1983 and 87 and indeed 92 um, contemplated a united Ireland by consent to try and persuade unionists to join the Irish Republic. It didn't say they were going to kick Northern Ireland out, but they wouldn't allow the unionists to have a veto on political development. Um, 
Incidentally, people could join the British Labour Party anywhere in the world except Northern Ireland um, because they were green tinged. They're the Labour Friends of Ireland, which really meant Friends of Nationalism within the Labour Party. Um, so they were discriminated against and some unionists said, don't matter we're all right wing, we want to vote Labour. You can be a socialist and a unionist, no contradiction. Um, anyway, so uh, the Northern Ireland Agreement went ahead, the civil servants were there. It didn't change a great deal, actually. And the security uh, cooperation from the Irish Republic with the UK was not as good as the United Kingdom had been hoping for. Lord Tebbit was honoured to have lunch with me in 2000, and he said, we got it wrong, what else can I say? They welched on that from the beginning, saying that the Irish government had uh, not upheld their end of the bargain. But anyway, it lasted to 98, and the, the, the Good Friday Agreement, one of the things the UUP um, boasted about is they'd managed to get Maryfield closed. Blair gave them that as a concession, and they were happy with that. So that is the Anglo-Irish Agreement.